Hello, this is Robert Whitaker with Journeys Through Time and uh, HansfordHeritage.com, episode 26. Um, probably the greatest interview I have heard to date of all the recordings that I have uh, that has to do with someone familiar with old Hansford. Um, Lawrence Wilbanks and, and his wife um, I wish that I knew exactly what his wife's name was. I keep hearing that her name is Virus. I don't know if that's an, a woman's name from uh, old times or, or, or if it's not Virus with a V, but it's Virus with a B as in boy. I, I have no idea. Um, so... I, have, I can't, I'm not even going to go there on, on what her name is, um, but Lawrence and his wife uh, tell a lot of great stories, and Jesse Davis um, gets into this and, and helps with the interview, and he gets Lawrence going on all these stories about Old Hansford, moving buildings to Spearman from Old Hansford, uh, wolves that were in the county at the time, they apparently had wolves roaming around uh, Hansford County back in those days, and he talks about a wolf hunt, tells a story about that. Threshing crews, um, the Wilbanks had threshing, three threshing machines, I think is, is what he said, and, and uh, so he get into some uh, narrative about uh, wheat threshing. Uh, so just story after story that I laughed often, uh, you'll enjoy this. Episode 26, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Wilbanks. Have a great one. Here with our guests on Spearman Information is George Young. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our program today. Spearman Information is brought to you by Baker and Taylor Drilling Company, and we've got some real fine people in our studio this morning, some that... Uh, it's going to make life pretty easy for me because Jesse Davis is here to uh, help with uh, talking with our guests. And Jesse, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you introduce our guests this morning. Well, George, you know, uh, this is supposed to be a round table discussion, I think, but it uh, looks to me like you've got a square table here. <laughs> In fact, we're enjoying coffee in the coffee room here at KBMF, and uh, we have two very special guests this morning. That's Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Wilbanks, and uh, everybody knows Lawrence and Virus Wilbanks. Lawrence, uh, uh, ladies are always first on uh, my program. I might mention this morning that Coy is out of town. He has a new grandson, and uh, George and I are going to try to run this thing, and we hope you enjoy it. But Virus, first, uh, I'd like to know how long you've been married. Oh, golly, 52 years, Jesse. I hate to say that. <laughs> 52 years. Yes, sir. I'm sure they've been 52 wonderful years, too. Wonderful happy years. <laughs> well, when did you folks first move to Hansford County? In 1922. We you? married in, at Butler, Oklahoma, and came to Spearman to live, and been here ever since. You mean uh, Lawrence has only been here since 1922? Oh, he came in 19 and, 19 and 2, but he and I married in 1922. In other words, he was nearly an old-timer before you moved here. Sure was. He spent about 20 years courting you, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, how in the world did, uh, in those days, how in the world did he get away over to Butler, Oklahoma? He was working in a garage there. And a garage? In a garage there at Butler, Oklahoma, and that's where I met him. Well, I didn't know he knew a wrench from a car jack. <laughs> <laughs> and you mean he really did work on cars? Yes, sir. He really was a good mechanic. Model T's? Model T's, mostly. <laughs> well, that's good. I was, army. I was in the mechanic in the Army. That's where I learned it, Jesse. Oh, is that right? Yeah, in World War One. Well, well, I learned a lot of that stuff. Some people wonder about army mechanics today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine it's a little different today than it was in those days. It had yeah, better it be. Is. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, now, you've been here since 192. There wasn't any idea of ever a town being here. No, old Hansford's the only was here. Old Hansford. Uh, I guess maybe you remember about moving old Hansford to Spearman. Oh, you? yeah, I remember all about that. Jesse, we're going to talk about that and many other things with Lawrence and Mrs. Wilbanks, and uh, looking forward to a real fine uh, visit with them today. We'll be back right after this word from Baker and Taylor Drilling Company. Jesse, perhaps we'd better point out to our listeners uh, for posterity's purposes that this interview is being conducted on March the 12th, a Tuesday morning, 1974. Now, perhaps 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, people will be listening to this interview with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Wilbanks, and they'll have some idea of what it was like at the uh, beginning of the 20th century in Hansford County. And well, now, just, oh, pardon me, excuse Well, me. I just wanted to say that I'm going to kind of leave it up to you this morning because uh, you're better at this than I am. <laughs> well, now, we're taping all these programs, right? That's right. And uh, is it all right to tell what you're going to do with these oh, tapes? Oh, I wish you would. <laughs> I think it would be nice. Well, I think it would be better if you tell what, what well, we're going to do. Our plans are, and in fact, we are in the process of doing it right now, we are going to place all of these uh, interviews that we've had on cassette recorders, on cassette tapes, and place them in an archive in the Hansford County Library uh, in monument to uh, George Buzzard. And they'll be available at the uh, Hansford County Library for anybody that wants to go in and check out the tapes and listen to them. And, uh, Maybe 50 or 100 years from now, they'll still be checking them out. We hope so. But we're going to donate these to the library. I think that's wonderful, George. In other words, in later years, if uh, we want to check out a tape, we check it out just like a book. Right. 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 You just go down and check one out. And if you have a cassette recorder, or if you don't have a cassette recorder, they have uh, cassette recorders that you can check out also and take the recorder and the tape, tapes home with you and uh, play them and bring them back when you're through with them. And it's just like checking out a book. Well, let's get back to Lawrence and Virus. Uh, Lawrence, where in the world did you go to school, or did you even go to school? Well, uh, we leave, left Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Texas in about 1900 and drove to Monday, Texas in wagons across, so I take my imagine around three weeks. And we stayed there one year and then come on out here and then we stayed in Channing quite a while. Then then they hauled some then my dad come out and built an old half dug out and then he put a floor in the top. And then we kids kid slept up in that top. And then they moved to my school schoolhouse about a mile and a half south of where we live now. And we went there for a few years and then we later went to Goodwill School after we got through with that place. And that old crew school out down here on Virgil's place now, and Margaret Evans and Kenneth raised their kids in it. Well, I'll see. Uh, what grade did you graduate from? I got up into the ninth. Well, that, that's, was, that's, that was pretty successful back in those days. Back in those days, uh, I, I thought maybe he might just have gotten to the fifth grade and graduated from that. Well, I graduated in the eighth and and part of the night and go all the way through, they throwed me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I might quit or something. I had to, I had to quit for some goals. Uh, somewhere along the line, I heard that you used to work in a sawmill or run a sawmill. Or well, I didn't really run it. They had one down here on the river. We hauled out of lumber up there and built sheds and corralled out of that old, it was about two foot wide, a lot of that old lumber. And, You'd nail it up, and, and it was wet, and when it had rained, and the sun had hit it, and it'd warp up. And it, we finally had to put one before it over to go to the crack set. In other words, that was cottonwood. Yeah, it, it just keep you nailing it all down. It just keep it twisted. <laughs> <laughs> it made out of them big old cottonwood <coughs> trees down there. I lived in a house one time that uh, down in Higgins. It was a pretty good house, but uh, it had a lot of cottonwood lumber in it, and I remember. An occasion where somebody tried to pull a nail out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Almost pulled the house apart. They couldn't pull the nail out. A lot of them that tried to pull them out, I was only trying to drive them in to keep the stuff from twisting a little more. <laughs> you didn't want to pull them out, huh? No. 
Well, uh, you're not an Okie, are you? No, I've uh, lived in Texas all my life, except this little while, one time. Well, I knew I've heard you say something about picking cotton near Altus, Oklahoma. Well, uh, when we first come here, the first two years, we had went to Altus, Oklahoma to pick cotton. Dad then did have enough money to stay here. So we crossed that old Canadian River down there one time, and we was coming back, and that thing was bank to bank, and uh, Milo Blodgett and Walls, uh, Mr. Walls pulled us across there, and they had lariat rope tied in the end of the tongue, wagon tongue. And we got out in there, and them old mules, they hit a quicksand hole, and the mules went down, they went to swimming, the old wagon kind of floated, and it went down pretty far. And of course, they was out on dry land, they had 30, 40 foot lariat ropes, and they pulled us out of that hole if they hadn't we'd have probably went down the river my goodness well i remember before they built the dams on the canadian river there were lots of quicksand there yeah they sure were and uh people had an awful lot of trouble crossing i've seen cars this top of them sticking out down there and they lost they say they lost one steam engine down there canadian in that's that right. river that's right it just sunk went plumb out of sight oh, that's when they were building the bridge down there yeah. Uh, at least I've heard the story. I, I have, too. And uh, they, they ran this steam engine. Seems like the water came up. Uh, very, uh, Lawrence, the river came up, and uh, they ran this steam engine out on the bridge to uh, hold it down. Something. Yeah. And, and they and but it washed the bridge away. And <laughs> sunk uh, the steam engine. <laughs> the steam engine is down somewhere in the quicksand. No telling how deep. It's probably the Chinese now, and they're cutting it up to shoot back at us. <laughs> <laughs> no telling. <laughs> Do you, uh, uh, Jay Fan? <laughs> I know back in those days, you had to do a lot of freighting. And uh, everything was by wagon and team. Do you remember any stories you could tell us about uh, freighting? Or maybe maybe you'd be with a bunch of cowboys and herd cattle, take them to market and the like. Well, I helped drive a few cows, but never too many. I was kind of small then. But I have rode them freight wagon takes on one back and around. One time they was coming down there and one old boy got drunk and he had a load of coal on. And they tied him on his wagon and he was going along and they come down that hill and them old horses went got they got into a run before they hit the bottom and they said that old boy was bouncing there when they had him tied on to that wagon to keep him falling off. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that was because he was just a little tipsy. Yeah, he got too tight, and they just tied him with a rope onto the way, get him off of that load of coal, so he couldn't fall off. Well, I know uh, the other day we had uh, a couple visitors, and uh, well, that was Olin Sheets and Winfred Lackey, and we were talking about. Uh, what you used for fuel in those days? Well, we we used cow tips mostly. We'd well, go out uh, here to these windmills and tie a tope. We'd put a rope in a tub handle and tie it around her stomach and drag that rope and fill them tubs full and drag them to the wagon and pour them in the wagon and haul them home. You'd go to any windmill and boy, they were thick. You could just pick up a load right quick. And we'd put them in a building then to stay dry in the winter time. Of course, we went to the river and got some, too. You go down there on that creek, and uh, if you'd get in there and get out of there, you was all right. If that old man caught you, it cost you a dollar a load. If he, if he didn't catch you, it didn't cost you anything. You know, Jesse, something that uh, just came to my mind, uh, referring back to the first of our program, when uh, you asked Byers how long uh, she and Lawrence had been married, 1972. You celebrated your golden wedding anniversary yes, two sir. years ago. Yeah. Well, I think that's wonderful. And uh, what's the uh, 75th anniversary? What is that called? That's what you're shooting for now. Right? Yes. <laughs> and a diamond, a new diamond ring. I you're, mean, that's you're in trouble, Lawrence. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> you're going to have to come up with a new diamond ring. Yes, you'll have to help me years. out on that, I guess. <laughs>
Well, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Jesse's got some pretty good contacts around town. <laughs> well, you know, I was down there in Oklahoma working that garage, and I met her, and I just lassoed over and put my brand on her and brought her home with me. <laughs> now, <laughs> Marge, is that really the way it happened? <laughs> well, not just quite. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, Lawrence, when you went to Altus, Oklahoma, uh, to... Uh, where was it uh, you were from, Virus? Butler, Oklahoma. And you were living in Altus at the time? No, I lived at Butler, Oklahoma, but they picked cotton at Altus, Oklahoma. Oh, and he worked I, in I the garage just, at Butler. I was a very small boy, and we went down there. But when you were cotton. in Butler, you were uh, about 20 years old? 22, I think, or something. 21 or somewhere along there. When you... Uh, when you left there, to, or when you left here to go to Butler uh, and work in the garage, did you have any idea that uh, you'd meet your beautiful wife? And uh, no, I just run it around, and did, we went down. Me and my cousin, and we run together all the time. And we went down there and found this garage, and it says nobody wasn't using it, so we decided to buy it and try it. So we just opened it up and went to run it. We run it a little over a year. Who was your cousin? Gilbert Wilbanks. Mm -hmm. Now, he and I went to the army together. I want to get a little something in here right now. Who was Virgil? That's my brother. Okay, and Jesse? Uh, he and I run the first cafe here in Spearman. My brother and Nellie, his wife, we had the first cafe here in town, and they had an oil well down here, the Dillon, and these old boys, they wanted us to cook them turkey gobbler, and so we cooked that turkey gobbler and sent it down there, and they named that oil well snorty gobbler right, that Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when did you open this restaurant, uh, this cafe here in Spearman? Do you remember? Well, it was right after Spearman started the building here. I can't remember exactly the date, but it was just right after the town started the building. It was about 1924, I imagine, wasn't it? No, it was earlier than that. Just Most earlier yeah. than that. Where was See, it located? They, right where Floyd's Lockers is now. Them old, you know, Snail name along with right, it. Right, that's on... Yeah, uh, that's... What is it? Not Hancock Street. What that is that street? Street goes down that way. What is it? the street. I've forgotten what it is. Well, I anyway, it's right there where Snell, Snell got his uh, shop, you know. Right. It was right in there. Virgil bought them lots in there. Now. He, it's called the City Cafe. Virgil and uh, Jesse, you, you're you pretty familiar with Virgil. Uh, in fact, you and he were kind of rough and ready in this country, weren't you? Well, I haven't been here near as long as Virgil. I've only been here 33 years, nearly 33 years. And, uh, oh, I don't know. It seems like we've been kind of hitting it off pretty good ever since <laughs> for 33 years. Well, but uh, I've heard some pretty wild tales on Virgil. <laughs> some of them, uh, I've heard some on Lawrence. <laughs> don't I'm tell sorry, me. I'm sorry that I, that I <laughs> saved uh, Lawrence, I'm sorry that I have to uh, <laughs> get you mixed up with some of your brothers. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that reminds me. There's a whole clan of Wilbankses in this country, and uh, Hicks was not your brother, was he? Cousin. He was a cousin. All right. Now then, uh, who were your... Uh, family. Do you mind telling me? No, uh, my harm was harm was my, was my older one and Virgil next and Hinder next and I was next and then Spray and then Faye. There were six of us and then we r m mother raised Charlie Day, that's Joe Day's daddy. He She raised him from a little boy. And then that old man, Mr. T.H. Moon, he come to us before I was ever born and he stayed with us till after he passed away. He never did leave. Well, Only uh, a short time at a time. Now, what was your daddy's name? Floyd. Floyd. Floyd Daniel Wilburn. Okay, and he came to this country. You came with him in 19... Well, he came ahead of us and bought this land, you see, and then he came back and moved us out here. But Charlie Day and his brother, Bishop Wilbanks, and and D.H. Moon moved the stock from there over here in the wagons. And one time they were coming along down one of these old mules got taking the colic, and the moon he got on a horse and run down to the neighbors. He went down the road to hunt out to find something. This horse had the colic, so while he was going, Charlie he taking this. I mean, uh, Bishop taking this old mule out and got him out, and he flanked Gary Deaton. He had him out there just a pitching and a bucking and going up in the air, you know, and he got that 
colic out of him by doing that, and Moon come back, and he was so mad, he was about to die, but the mule had, Moon, he'd cured, I mean, Bishop, he had cured the mule. And <laughs> Moon made that trip for nothing. Yeah, and he didn't get any medicine neither. <laughs> oh, no. Well, is it true that the story I've heard on you is that you used to go to a uh, I believe it was Hayes Grocery and the old Hansford and Steel Crackers. <laughs> well, we didn't really steal them, the old Mr. Hayes. Well, that's the way I heard it. Well, we <laughs> sold them in a roundabout way, and Mr. Hayes, he'd give it, we'd buy the sardine, the nickel worth of cheese, and he'd give us all the crackers we'd eat. Well, that's the way it was. Yeah, he had pepper sauce and a little table over there, and that's the only place we had to eat when we'd go over there. Mr. Hayes had a good thing going, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he had an old hitching post in front. We'd all his tire teams, too. And then later on, Hot Lon Hayes taking that store over, and, and he sold gasoline out of the barrels. He'd go out there with a can and draw you a five-gallon can out and pour it in your car in the funnel and cost 15 cents a gallon. That's when the cars... 15 cents a gallon. <laughs> and that's where I seen the first trucks came out there, and they... They were chain drives, the first trucks, and cars was the chain first chain drives. Boy, it's been a sight. Say, uh, I had a guest yesterday, uh, Fendorf Schubert, and uh, he, in passing, after the program was over, he just kind of dropped this little tidbit on me. He said, be sure and ask Lawrence about all the fights on uh, the street of Old Hansford. <laughs> what was all this about? <laughs> well, we had they with lots of fights going on down there. <laughs> that was one form of entertainment, I guess. Yeah, yeah, well, every Saturday, somebody would have a fight on Old, Main, on old Hansford over there somewhere. Well, Lawrence, I know that uh, that was just pretty much part of a normal living routine. Yeah, but, that's uh, right. Now, you and Virgil uh, also had something else you liked to do. You liked to ride motorcycles, didn't you? Yeah, we run cow oats and antelope down, and we take a shotgun, one would get behind, they'd run up the side of a cow oat and shoot him, and, and we'd run antelope down. And, and I finally got to wrangling horses on one. I, I'd always have to get up about the sun up and go get the horses in the morning. After I got that motorcycle, I could get up and would know about where they'd go every night. I'd turn them out on the grass, you know, the country was open, there wasn't no fence. And I'd take off on that motorcycle, and I had two dogs, and they'd go with me, and of course I'd run off and leave, and they'd meet me on the way. And, and these horses got to where every time they'd hear that motorcycle run, they'd all head for the house. So I got to where it wasn't very hard to get them in. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. They knew they knew better than to wait until you came after them. Huh? Yeah. Well, well Lawrence, uh, excuse go me, ahead, George. Yes. Uh, before we went on the air, we were talking about uh, when old Hansford moved to Spearman, and George was very interested in the way you moved the houses to Spearman. Could you give us a little story and tell us a few things about how they got these houses over here? Yeah, there's a man from Wichita, Kansas, and his son named Tandy come down here from Wichita, and, and uh, he had a set of flat rollers, oh, they were 18 inches wide, I guess, and it was four in a bundle, and there was four sets of rollers, and then he had big timber, and he'd jack them up, and he'd put four under each corner, and, and he'd tie them all together with a cr with a cross, but with a big timber cross and chain them. And then they'd run a chain from there out in front, and he'd tie on them with that steam engine, and he'd pull them over here from old Hansford. Of course, it'd take him quite a while to jack them up and get them ready. And he'd pull that old hotel up there at the hill, and it was so heavy, the old engine had spin its wheel, so he had to run a cable to the top and put in a dead man. And then he got a block and tackle, and he'd just pull it just the length of that block and tackle each time until he got it up the hill. Okay, now you was talking about a dead man. Uh, some of the younger folks that might accidentally be listening in wouldn't know what a dead man is. Boy, well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, well, see. they'd dig a big hole, deep hole, and they'd put a big post in there. Then they'd dig a trench from the bottom and slope it away out so it wouldn't pull out. They'd pull it from the bottom of the ground. And they'd put a chain around that, and they'd run it out there, and then they'd tie it to it. And you couldn't pull them out of the ground. You'd put them way down there along them, you know. And in other words, the harder it pulled, the deeper the... Well, it was in the bottom, around. and they'd pull again the bottom. They'd yeah. dig a long trench so it'd pull from the bottom all the time. That's really something. That's quite a way. Now, how long did it take uh, this old steam engine 
usually once they got this thing, this house on the, the platform, how long did it take them to move it from Old Hansford to Well, if they got it up the hill, it wouldn't take very long. They could make about four miles an hour with it if they got them up the hill. Okay, from start to finish, uh, what would it take? A day or two to move a house that far? Or? Well, if they got it on them blocks, they could move them up here in a, a one and a half a day. How long did it take them sometimes to get them on blocks? Well, two or three days according to how big it was. My goodness, it'd take <laughs> doggone near a week then just to move one It'd take one quite house. a while to get a house. Well, the little houses, now they could get them on there in a day, a small house. Yeah. But a big house, it'd take them quite a while. That old P. Monkey Maze store up there on the corner is moving from old Lancaster over here too. Well, now, uh, there's a building, let's see, I guess it's still standing, the old uh, Burke Briley blacksmith shop. Yeah, it's uh, still no, there. It's moved from there. Old Hansford here. And that was originally in Old Hansford, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, I heard a story, and I've got to find out who it was that told me this story, but I heard that uh, the people that built that blacksmith shop hauled the timbers from New Mexico by mule train, hauled them into uh, Old Hansford, uh, and just had the raw timbers and cut them there and built that old blacksmith shop, and then uh, did they, when they moved that from Old Answer to Spearman, Lawrence, did they move it intact or did they have to? Yeah, they just braced it and moved it intact just like it is. Well, See, they, they put braces in them, cross braces, and nailed them together to the walls and to two fours. And they braced them up good and then jack them up and put them on these long timbers and they could move them. That must have been quite an operation. I would have <laughs> liked to have been here to see them move that town. I, well, I'm just fascinated by this. <laughs> Of course, we didn't think much about it then when they was moving it. Well, it's sort of routine for you then, wasn't it? Did I tell you about Virgin and I killing that loafer wolf right here in Spearman when the, when no. the town first built? Well, they, they just had the little office here all day and laid the town a lot of 19 and 18 or 19. We struck a loafer wolf out here about two miles south. And we just had two shotgun shells. We was going to Old Answer to get some more shells, and it was about four inches of snow on the ground, about soft snow. And we stuck this old loafer about two miles south of there, and we'd taken after him this Model T, and of course he's down on the top and had the windshield down. And we'd run him, let old Model T wide open, and we'd run him about a mile before we could gain any on him. And we got up in about 25 feet of him, uh, the third inch, and we just had two shells, and I told the word, I said, well, I said, try him once, see if you can hit him. I said, that'll slow him down. So he hit him with that old, and you just see the shots go up his back and his hair raise, and boy, he taken off for just a little bit, but of course that's weak, and then, then we run up on him, and we got pretty close to him next time, and then he shot him again, and he finally laid down as though we'd taken the old car jack, Model T car jack, and finished killing him. <laughs> we had to be kind of careful because, boy, he had long tushes. Yeah, you didn't want him to get a hold of you. Oh, and he had a, he had a great long tail, and, and he had great long dashes. And we'd killed several cows up there. The house, and it's winter time. we had them stacked up, and he, they looked like his pups. Oh, Besides no. that old big wolf, boy, he was a big one. Well, what kind of a wolf did you call this, Virgil? Or we called them loafers. Loafers. The lobos, they call them. Some well, lobo. People. Now they yeah. have, I've heard that word. They I've call them lobos and loafers both. And, and uh, they would tackle steers and kill them. They would kill a pretty good sized steer. There's an old boy up in Mexican up in Mexico. He tried to rope one one time and he liked to got him. Were there very many of those around the country? Not too months? many. You just see one now and then. I suppose now they're all dead and gone. Huh? Yeah, I guess they're all gone. Never see one anymore. I have in a long time. Well, were they something about the size of a mountain lion or or a shepherd dog? Or? Well, they was uh, three or four times bigger than the goat. About three times, well, I imagine. They were <laughs> bigger about than three, they, was, they was about three times bigger than the cow, I guess. Dog on there be as big as a calf, some of them. And they them. had muscles in their arm, they like a human. We killed that thing and stood him up on the fence after he froze, and we taken his picture. And he had grit, big muscles in his arm, that old teeth with grit, long tushes. And one time, Dad and I and the family were going to, from here to Oklahoma, we had a place up there. And the XIT range, we was going through there in an old buggy, and they were the car, they, the XIT had 
brought a bunch of cattle in there, and that and that El Frigo Spring, they had that water in it was kind of alkali, and it's hot. And they they drink a lot of that water, and a whole bunch of them steers died, and we was driving along there, and and there was seven cows and one loaf of wolf at this carcass, right side of the road. We drove up beside of them, and Dad stopped, and uh, all the cows trotted off, but this old loafer, he showed his teeth at us, and he never moved a bit, so we drove on. We didn't have no gun. And you wasn't about <laughs> to go after him bare-handed? Oh, man, he was, he was vicious looking. <laughs> I'll bet he was. Virus, uh, were you and Lawrence married all during these misadventures <laughs> we've well, been talking about? Uh, some of them, but not all of them. But I remember how they used to hunt rabbits out at the farm and sell their ears for a, so much a dozen. You mean there was a bounty on dollar yes, a dollar a dozen for these rabbit ears since he was discussing the coyotes and things. Well, Lars, do you know why they had the bounty on the rabbits? Were they eating crops? Or yeah, they were they so was many. They were destroying plenty. stuff. They'd destroy lots of stuff. Well, I'll be. I didn't know that. I hunted so many rabbits, I got to where I never would shoot one. I said, and I'd make him run and shoot him with a target. <laughs> they used to adventure. have rabbit drives here. <laughs> yeah, we used to have those? rabbit drives and they'd kill them with a thousands. Again. Well, I'll be. I guess this is something like the uh, rattlesnake hunt down at Sweetwater where everybody just gets together uh, once a year. They ship them out here in car load. They, they, to Kansas City or somewhere for to make some kind of fertilizer or something out of them. They hunt them and ship them out, you know. Well, I'll be. That's really something. Jesse, we're going to have to pause for a word from Baker and Taylor Drilling Company, but we're going to be back right after that to talk with uh, Lawrence and Virus Wilbanks a little more and find out a little about the history of Hansford County. Right now, this message from Baker and Taylor Drilling Company. About six miles west of Hansford of the Creek. We're visiting with Lawrence and Virus Wilbanks, and Jesse Davis is here. Uh, Jesse, I'm very, very glad you came this morning, as well as Lawrence and Virus. And uh, you've been a tremendous asset so far today, and I know that you'll continue to be. Just, uh, we were talking about something while the uh, message for Baker and Taylor was on the air. Something that I'm sure, Jesse, is of interest to you, being in the pharmaceutical business and being a pharmacist. Uh, we were talking about doctors. Yes, uh, Lawrence, uh, back in 1902, there was not very many doctors around, was there? Well, when we first came here, Dr. McCoy lived west of Old Hanford, about six miles up the creek. Dr. McCoy? Yeah, his name was McCoy. Was he the only doctor here? He was the only doctor here. And I remember I had taken the appendicitis, and uh, it was, my brother rode after him, so it was the next day before we got out home. My goodness. And then he, so then the, the caterers up the creek there, they're the only boy in the country that had any ice. They'd put it off, off and they'd chop it out of the pallet there and put it in a building and cover it up with straw, you know. And he told my brother, said, you go up there and get some of that ice and put on it, put ice packs on it for about three days and don't let him out on the beach. So he had to drive plumb back up the old Hansford, about six miles seven west, and get a chunk of ice out of that ice house. That's the only ice in the country. My goodness. And I laid there in the bed about three days with that ice on my side. That's uh, when I had appendicitis. That must have been something. You're lucky to be here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, you and see, the, ice, ice would localize the infection in there and would help. Uh, of course, uh, they didn't do any surgery in those days. No. And uh, later on, 1917, the fifth day of June, my, I had it operated on in Ballard. But we had some more doctors here. Dr. Deacon that came next, and he's the first man that ever had an automobile in here. And boy, we thought that was something. <laughs> and then Dr. Haney and Dr. Gibber and Dr. Gower and Dr. Jones was all here then after that. And they lived... Uh, over there in Old Hanford, Dr. Deacon did, and Dr. Well, they all lived over there till they moved to Spearman. And Dr. Jones, uh, Dr. Jones is here, and Dr. Heaney, Dr. Gibner, Dr. Gower, they all lived here, and now they're passed away. And then my brother in law, Bradford, he bought the old phone off at Spearman, they moved it up here to Hanford. And he was the deputy sheriff there for several years, too. Well, Lawrence, uh, in, in those days when we had when you had your first telephone, uh, what did you use for telephone poles? Well, they used to, well, they had a little slim pole from Old Hansford Dockle Tree, but though out in the rural country, they just used two before. 
I never forget one time we'd come out of old Hansford and they had one of these two fours and and I re we was in an old buggy trotting along and this fellow Moon was in the back seat and I raised up and grabbed this tube, uh, grabbed this phone line and I turned around in the seat. I was a pretty small boy and I held it just long as I could and when I turned it loose, well, it caught him right on the chin and oh. throwed him out backwards, him seat and all. <laughs> he got up and he said, I'll cut every damn phone line in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I come south, I'm going to bring my flowers. Well, uh, <laughs> He what? never did know. He just thought that thing caught him on the chin. He never did know I had a hold of it. <laughs> and oh, another, boy. Another, I roped the one that went through our pasture over west there, and I jerked the saddle horn out of the saddle, <laughs> and that kind of served me. The saddle belonged to my brother, and Henry, you know, older than I was, so I put the saddle in, in the horse and the corral there, and we had some corral, and he run, and my brother went out and said, you know that horse running on that corral and jerked the saddle <laughs> horn out of my horse, <laughs> out of my saddle. That relieved me. I didn't know how I was going to get out of that. You didn't, you didn't admit anything. No, I never did say a word. <laughs> well, the reason that I asked such a silly question, I guess it was a silly question, was because I had heard that uh, the only telephone poles you had were uh, just your barbed wire fence pole. Well, that was the first thing that's come along. They just put them on the barbed wire. Just right, uh, right on top of the uh, well, well, cedar post. Yeah. And us kids, we went to Paminis. We'd go along and take a wire and wire it from one down to the other and ground them out. <laughs> oh, boy, just... Then they'd have to hunt it up. I guess this kids were mean in those days, too. I just started to say, this this gentleman here had his youthful experiences, and I can tell. We was kids. We went out and got us some tin cans, you know, and put wire in them, dug a hole in them, and put wire in them. We'd tie them on these poles and think we could lift them, too, you know, but we couldn't. <laughs> couldn't quite pick it up, could No, we? we couldn't pick it up on them cans. <laughs> well, when did they, uh, do you remember about when they started putting up the large, uh, the long, tall telephone poles and putting these phone lines up in the air so you couldn't get to them? Well, it was uh, several years after we came here. I don't remember exactly the date, but it was several years after that they started building. They built one to Guyman, and they built one to Ologgy. And the one they had to Ologgy, they used to have a road and a mail act went to Ologgy, and I seen the Indians come down that old trail. Is that right? Yeah, they'd come from Oklahoma going to Mexico out here somewhere and then they'd go back and then they'd go back, you know. Do you know which tribes they were with? No, I don't really know. All I just knew they were Indians, just remember seeing them. They'd go to old Hansford and they'd take things in to learn them stores. They'd have to watch those Indians pretty close and they'd get in them stores. Were you kind of Worried a little bit about the Indians, or no? They? The Indian never did bother us. When we came to Oklahoma that time, there's lots of Indians along the side of the road. Dad had an old double barrel shotgun. He killed a lot of prairie chickens to eat as we come along. But these Indians, they'd be on horses and the foot, standing there on the side of the road looking at you. And they would, they would say nothing. They just stand there and look at you. You drive by. Well, you know, we see Indians today, Lawrence and. Uh, Really, unless you get to know them, they don't look uh, much like the Indians that we think no, about. No, they but don't. What about uh, back then? Did they look like Indians? Were oh, they yeah, dressed? they had long hair and, and then braids down the back, you know, and, and they really looked like Indians. They had blankets, a lot of them on them. They were really Indians then. Of course, these now are kind of, some of them are just half Indian, you know. They kind of right. all crossed up, and they're smart people. They sure are, and uh, it. But it must have been quite an experience for you, even as a young boy, to uh, see all these Indians along the way. And it hadn't been too many years uh, before that that uh, our country was faced with an Indian uprising. And no, Indian that's fight. right. I remember uh, that Billy Dixon, that Indian fight down here on the river. You know Billy Dixon. Yes. We used to stay in that old log cabin that he left down there when he left there, and he moved up in Oklahoma where we were, and they had a school up there. And it was in a country, a woman in a house, you know, it just didn't have no school out there, just this lady taught it there. And Billy Dixon kids and, and Dora and uh, Bobby and and Billy Jr., we went to school with their kids up there in the school one year. Well, Lawrence, did the Indians have uh, campsites around here back at that time? Well, I don't remember any. They were, I think the Indians were about all gone out here when we came here. The ones you saw mainly were just ones that were moving from Yeah, they'd go back to the garden and the one we seen in Oklahoma. They had a tribe down there, but 
SE by uh, Cameron, Oklahoma. They had a big Indian tribe there, you know, was out on that creek. It's a regular reservation of them. Well, Lars, when you were growing up in uh, Butler, were there any Indians around that area at that time? Oh, yes, there was lots of Indians, and they were mostly Cherokee. And uh, uh, I know we children were taught to be a little bit afraid of them, and uh, my father got along well with them. I grew up on a farm there, and we lived on the Washita River, and there was lots of Indians there. And uh, my daddy gave them beef, I know this is terrible to say, but many times his calves would bloat on the alfalfa. He'd go call the Indians, and they would come and get them and take them home for me. And we could sit out in the evening and listen. They were in just a few miles of where we lived. And uh, you could hear them beating their drums at night. And right. it was full sound, but it was kind of scary. I started to say that must have been, uh, at times, a frightening experience. Uh, uh, this town of Red Moon <coughs> was just an Indian town that was near Hammond, Oklahoma. And, of course, at Quentin and all in there, there's still lots of Indians there. As, <coughs> excuse me. As a child, did, uh, did your parents teach you to stay away from the Indian uh, uh, villages and reservations and so forth? Uh, yes, but uh, w my older brother, I think the reason that he uh, was so... Uh, strong-willed about it. My older brother was going with one of the Indian girls, and she was a beautiful girl, but did go on to school and became a nurse. So he would have done well had he gone on. And <laughs> it could have. It could have been, been a, a wonderful a, romance. Certainly sounds like it. Well, Desi, you know, I'm going to hand it back to you. Uh, well, I, I was wondering uh, back in the days when Lawrence first came here. That, of course, we had uh, old threshing machines and. Uh, separators uh, did you ever follow a threshing crew yeah i've followed them and i've run them i, I own we own three threshing machines oh you did yeah two cases and the avery and we had three or four old gasoline engines and i helped to look helped around them old steam engines a long time ago some of them as a kid and uh then we, when we bought gasoline engines, they were when we bought them, they were gasoline engines. Then they you know, up to dated them, you know, and that water was so far apart here. Sometimes they'd nearly run out of water before they could get back with it. They'd just whistle and whistle and afraid they were going to get so low, and they'd sometimes they'd have to shut down and wait for water. You know, if that water below that crown sheet and they put it in there, it'd blow them up. Well, that's a good question too, Lawrence. Back in those days, there weren't irrigation wells. Uh, what'd you do for water? Well, uh, we first came here, we hauled water in barrels. And just stored it? Well, didn't well, you drill wells some, too? Yeah, we drilled. I drilled a lot of water wells around over this country, and I worked all out west of Del Hart, over around the Lux IT range. And Charlie Day, we had a tent out there. And we worked for him, and we just go from place to place, and windmill and fix these old 18-foot eclipse milled as direct strokes in. We work on them old mills, and if we couldn't fix the well, we'd drill a new one. And we'd drill, drill lots of new wells and build towers and raise them and done everything like well, that. Well, now, was this after you got married? No, that was before I got married. Well, uh, that, that kind of dates you back a little farther then. Yeah. I, one time we were working on a place out there, and, and I carried an old 3030, and I had an old, then I'd gotten me an old Model T car. First car I've had was an old 1911 Ford with a radiator, brass radiator. Charlie Day left it up there in the sand, the old southwest Clayton. He gave it to me so I'd go get it, so I went out and got it. And I kept that old car a long time. There's an old curlew lit out there about 100 yards on a little knoll. We were working there, and I got that old Winchester, and I said, I'll believe I'll see if I can kill that thing. We'll have something to eat. And just by accident, I cut his head off. <laughs> and, uh, Maybe we, you were just uh, we a good brought shot. him. Uh, we brought him in and cleaned him, and, and that's the toughest thing I ever seen. They couldn't cook you. That's for me to clean him. <laughs> oh, uh, that's something uh, I bet George is never as a curlew. No, sir, and uh, I'm I'm curious as to what it looks like. <laughs> well, well they're a tall red bird, and they got us about a six-inch bill. They build about six inches long, and they're tall and slim. But they got the longest bill in the bird I ever seen. It's about six inches long. Were there very many around this country then? Yeah, then they were a lot of them. 
you would kick cripple one and he'd just stand there and holler and holler and all the rest and just fly around and you could have killed the whole bunch of them. <laughs> they wouldn't leave you cripple one to get him to holler. And <laughs> I'm surprised they, they didn't leave. call them goofy birds or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, they call them curlews. You hardly ever see one anymore. Once in a great while they'll come through here, some of them, but they're about the thing of the past. I haven't seen one for years and years, but uh, I do remember seeing one or two curlews. But I, I was satisfied that George had never seen one. Well, I certainly haven't. Uh, well, I've killed a lot of them. We used to get lots of geese here, too. The geese used to stay on the river here every winter with a thousand. Now, I've seen a few geese. In fact, I've hunted a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> Virus, would you uh, like to tell us a little bit about some of the hardships that you might have had after you got married and getting started? Did you live in a dugout, or did you have you a house, or did you live in the country, or did you live in town, or just tell us anything that you might that might come into your mind? <laughs> well, we lived out on the Wilbanks farm out here, five miles southeast of Spearman, and it was a two-room house, just one of the old-fashioned houses that had two rooms. And, of course, there was always lots of work to do. And we had the old coal stoves that we baked and cooked with. <coughs> and we always had uh, a lot of men to cook for out there because they worked uh, lots of men in uh, uh, drilling and harvesting their maize and wheat and all those things. And my job was always pretty hard of cooking. <coughs> I imagine it required an early start, didn't it? It did. We got up early and always got to bed late. I'd like to tell you about the first the wheat plant we wheat we raised here. My dad he well he went in front of me with a seemly sack around his neck and had it split and about a half a bushel in it and he would scatter that wheat by hand. I'd come along with an old had six discs on each side and a tongue in it and a lever to adjust it as and much you wanted to angle the disc, deepen it, and I had four mules to it. He sold that wheat by hand, and I disked it under. And the next year, there was a horsepower thrash machine that first come along. It had 18 head of horses in it. And it had a tumbling shaft with a big old, it had a big old cogwheel in it, and then a little, and then a tumbling shaft run up to this separator. And it had a little cog, and then a big one. And them horses, and then the man sat up in the middle of that thing and drove them, and he had a brake on there. He could put this brake on. And uh, they had a man stood up there with goggles on the handkerchief over, and he had two tables on each side, and he and there's two men standing there cutting binds. He draped this feed in there and, and put it in this old separator, and they had a spout out there that had a, a divider on it like a Y, and it had a a thing and you just shift from one side to the other and they had a singly sack and caught that wheat in sacks and they put it in the wagon and they take them out there and, and the, the greeneries oh, wow. out of them sacks and uh, I just thought that would be pretty interesting boy it, it really is because it's a lot different today isn't it yeah well in those, in those days Lawrence too didn't you uh, long came the header barge yeah uh, that was a little later after you moved here wasn't it yeah, well, we're going to have to help me again, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, we bought a header, and we had two header barges, and then we got the head, and then, then Hicks had two headers, and so we had a thrash machine, and Hicks, he suggested that we all go in together and place a stack in it, just head it, and throw it th direct through that old thrash machine, and we wouldn't have to stack it and do all that extra work, so that cut out on a lot of work. Well, no, that's, that was one thing I was going to ask you about. Now, down... Uh, where I was raised, of course, just down to Higgins, where they used to use these old header barges and uh, stack the wheat. Yeah. And then the stacks would stay there till a uh, thrashing crew could come by and uh, thrash the wheat for them. Yeah, they'd let it go through a sweat, they'd call it, you know, and then dry out, and they'd come along and thrash it. I've, I've pulled through a menu between them old sacks and curl that wheat up in them big old long well, and wheels. Uh, some, some places, thrash it. some places they shocked the wheat, wouldn't they? Yeah, they shocked it a lot of places. Now, uh, you've, you, seen, you've seen shocks, George. Well, isn't this where they, just, where they just go in and uh, knock the heads off? No, they cut, they cut pretty long stems and, and uh, they'd... Uh, tie a whole bunch of this stuff together. I, I don't know. Can you explain Funnel that? Funnel it. They'd cut it with a binder. Well, yeah. no, the, the headers, they just uh, put it in these header barges, 
Well, well I was talking about, I was talking about the old sharks. Oh, yeah, they'd bind it, and then they'd hold it in with wagons. And uh, we thrashed about 10,000 bushels over East here one time with a bit of barley. It was uh, cut with binders like that, real good barley, and we thrashed about 10,000 bushels and put it all in one straw stack. Boy, that was a big old straw stack. I'll bet it was. Now, George didn't know, he said I sprung something on him when I said header barbage. George, that was a great big contraption that had, uh, well, paddles in front, you know, kind of like uh, the combines do today. Yeah. Except it was not a combine. It would just uh, cut the heads off of this wheat, you see. And that's what Virgil was talking about when he put that in the wagon and then they take it to the thrasher and thrash it right there. Well, there's no... This whole thing, it had a, a long, big pipe that run away back, and it had a trail wheel behind, and it had three horses on each side, had six set of horses. I, I, brought, I cut, run them in, you know, several of them. And you stood between this pole and guided it with your legs, you know. And when you'd come to a corner, we had what they call the wheel horses, the side ones that tied, and these, You'd pull them out and make them pull it right square around and make a square corner and then take off the other way. The wheel and as you'd come around, you'd jump back, straddle it, and straighten it up. And that's the way you guided it is out in front of you, about 15 feet, hit her part. And it had a, two canvases and a, it run up in the air inside of a chute, you know. And that's, these canvases would carry that wheat up in that chute and, in the, and pile it in these header barges and then they'd take it and stack it. That must have really been something. Lawrence, we're just about to run out of time, but uh, uh, I was real interested in this story you told about that 18 head of horses. Uh, how many double trees or single trees? Well, they just had a, from this thing in the middle, it, they had long poles run out from it, and, and they'd, it, they'd had tree, two horses to each pole, and they'd tie the, each one in front of them to this pole, and they just made a complete round circle. And they had this, this tumbling shaft was covered up with a box. And uh, they staked that thing down with orange stakes. They'd taken a lot of stakes to hold it down. And uh, the, of course, these, uh, they'd have, for every horse, they'd have a long pole run out, and they'd tie They'd have a double tree to that, and they'd tie it from the front one to this one, the next one to that one, just made the complete circle, you see. And the, the horses just tied all of them to these poles, and they couldn't get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Had them tied in pretty good. Yeah. Well, uh, I see Virus has uh, picked out a little story here, and uh, I think we still have time for her to talk a minute. And uh, what would you like to add to this story, Virus? Well, I'd just like to tell about uh, Ruth Bryan, Lawrence's cousin, that painted the old granary that still stands out home that uh, the Wilbanks has lived in soon after they came to this country when their house burned. And she painted it in beautiful coloring and gave it to us for our 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, we are very proud of it, and we hung it in our living room. And sometime I'd like for you to come by and see it. It's a beautiful oh, I'd painting. Love to, we'd love to see it. Daddy, I'd like to take it by. We had three pet antelopes out there when we first came here. And they'd follow us near about two, three, four, well, halfway to the school. And then they'd just break and run back to the house as hard as they could go. And every once in a while, a wild antelope would come along and maybe in the half a quarter of a mile, and they'd run out there about halfway to them and look at them, and man, they'd come back to the house as hard as they could run, and they would go to them. Well, they'd they, stay right there. Well, the I house. didn't know you could tame an antelope. Yeah, we had three pet ones. They just gent but you can't rub them only on the head. You can't rub them on the back, boy, they'll take off. <laughs> they don't but you can pet to. their heads, and we raised them with quills. We'd pull a quill out of a turkey feather and wrap a rag around it and stick it in the bottle, and feed them milk. That's the way we raised them. Well, I'll be. Oh, that's the reason they were tame. Yeah, you we caught them when they were little. Yeah. And they was gentle. And them things stayed there till they was grown, some of them, until they died. Well, George, how much more time do we have? Jesse, I believe we've got, uh, oh, about five more minutes. About five more minutes? Uh, I don't know of anything particular to ask uh, these folks. 
Well, yeah, Virgil might have Say, I'd another, like to... Yo, there's one here. time they won't know old oh, makes the cars we had in this country. Where were they? Say, do you remember the old E, M, and F? I, I remember a lot of them, Jesse. I can't remember the name, but I can tell you the name well, of the Well, the name of this car was E, M, and F, and that meant every morning fix them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth, eh? Well, Before you went anywhere, you had to repair them. Well, you sure did. Lawrence yeah. got several notes When here. they first, uh, these old cars first came out, they had a Rio and a Buick and a Dixie and a Star and a Trombley and a Hudson and a Saxon and a White Stanley Steamer and a Case, and a Hupmobile, and a Jackson, and a Chevrolet 490. And Uncle Manny, you want to know one time about the numbers, and I remember he had his number painted 59 on the back of his old car with paint, and when you registered a car then, it cost you 50 cents to register as long as you had it, and you didn't even have a tag. Well, uh, but you just paid the 50 cents. You paid 50 cents, and they give you a number, and, and that's... A, Uncle you Manny had a number. You mentioned one old standard car, and that was a Maxwell. Yeah, it? they had a Maxwell, too, after that. Yeah. You was talking about that Chevrolet 490, Lawrence. Yeah. I remember that car very well. It had a cone clutch. Yeah, and it jumped higher and died deader. And <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't release the clutch yeah, easy. Without it jumping. And... Uh, you know what a cone clutch is, Yes, George? sir, I do. Now you're getting into my area. <laughs> All right. You, you try to drive one of those Chevrolet 490s, you'd have to speed it up a little bit, and you'd let it out real easy, and the first thing you know, you'd jump about. Right. Yeah, about and it twists the axle out pretty often. You bet. <laughs> Uncle Manny, he said them thing could jump higher, die deader, and make more noise than anything he ever seen. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, I'm familiar with that cone clutch. Uh, I had uh, a course in mechanics in school, and uh, we talked about that old cone clutch and studied it and saw how it worked and everything. But you, I can see the point. If you yeah. lay out on that thing too fast, you pick your head up off the ground. You know, Uncle Manny taking two header wheels and built him a tractor out of them and a chain drive, and he hauled, and uh, he put this automobile in it, and he hauled two wagon loads of wheat to take home and back with it, and he broke one of the wheels down and coming back, and he never did go any more with it. My goodness. You know, Jesse, we're going to have to have uh, Lawrence and Virus come back, and uh, I'm sure that there are a multitude of things that we haven't covered here this morning, but we have run out of time. Well. And uh, why don't we just uh, see if we can set up a day and have them come back and talk some more about those oh, days. Oh, I'd be tickled to death because these are two of my favorite people. And, uh, well, the other day when Coy asked me if I'd be back Tuesday, I, I wouldn't agree to come back on Tuesday. But Saturday, Virus and Lawrence were in the store, and uh, she wanted to know if I was going to be back here on Tuesday, and I told her I didn't think I would. And I didn't want to make a habit of doing this all the time. And she said, I want you to be there because Lawrence is going to be on the <laughs> And I said, I'll be there. <laughs> all right. Well, Jesse, we want you to come back as often as you can and help us with the program. It's uh, always a real big pleasure to have you here to visit and uh, talk to our guests. And Lawrence and Virus, we definitely want you to come back again, and we'll see if we can work out a day. And Thank you, George. For you. And I was glad to be here if I had if I done any good. <laughs> oh, you have given us a treasure of wealth that uh, will be cherished from now on. I, I just know it will be, and I've just been tickled to death to sit here and, and just take part in the visit this morning and listen. And uh, Virus, you take care of this man now. <laughs> Thank you, George. I've enjoyed it very much. And if you want to check out one of those tapes later on and listen to it and see how many mistakes I made, <laughs> why, you can get them down at the library just a little later on. Jesse, sometime we'll have to get you and get you to play it for us. <laughs> oh, right. I'll be glad to do it. Lawrence and Virus Wilbanks has been our have been our guests this morning. Jesse Davis has been here to visit with them, along with me, George Young, and I hope that you've enjoyed the program. We'll look forward to having Lawrence and Virus back again in the near future. And Jesse, you feel free to come just any day you want to. You show up and we'll put you to work. <laughs>
Thanks for being here, all of you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. It was glad to be here. Thank you. Jesse, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you, George. And we'll remind you that the program today has been brought to you by Baker and Taylor Drilling Company of Spearman, working to make Spearman grow and building a stronger economy. So until tomorrow, have a very pleasant day, everyone.